So titled why most learning content strategies will be outdated in the next six months because of the great knowledge that these great speakers are, are going to be able to share to us from both Fuse, from Easy Generator, and from Udemy. So I just want to introduce you to the amazing panel that we have. Uh, so Ryan McBride is our head of creative, our creative director, genius, and, and um, many, many words and superlatives that are not enough to find. Uh, Faraz from Easy Generator, a great partner of ours, a new partner of Fuse. Uh, so really looking forward to all the great knowledge to share around AI. Uh, Ross, another great partner of ours from Udemy, who's going to show us the latest innovations and AI innovations coming out of Udemy. And Silver and Anarman are our event managers and coordinators helping us run this massively successful webinar. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Lots of enthusiasm there in the background there. Um, so this is our agenda. and um, We're going to make it quite informal. Um, and um, questions, more than happy for questions to come in um, during, this, during the session. Um, if it's a really great question, we might pause, answer the question, and get some discussion from the panel. Or uh, alternatively, just jump in. One of the panel panel will jump in and uh, answer a question there and then, as we go. So that's our agenda. Uh, we're going to kick off first of all in around the area of framing it around consumption and curation, um, and then we're going to get into the whole creation bit and wrap it up to the, towards the end with hopefully some great conversations. So if I if I kick off um, at the first part. Actually, maybe I'll do Maybe let the panel introduce themselves first. So let me just jump out of here. I do think it'd be nice for you to get a flavor for the rest of the panel. So let's just go around the room quickly for those that are talking. Ryan, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Hope you're well. I'm Ryan McBride. I'm the creative director of content here at Fuse, and I'm in charge of a global team of animators, learning producers, and videographers. Nice to meet you all. <laughs> Yes, for us. All right. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Uh, Faris here, Director of Global Alliances at Easy Generator. And um, I've been um, in this industry for more than around seven, nine years. So hopefully I can add a, a few good insights into a fantastic webinar that we're having today. Looking forward to it. Yes. And Ross? Yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, Ross is my name. Uh, coming to you from a not so sunny Dublin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but glad to, be, glad to be here today. I am the Partner Success Manager with Udemy. Um, I spend time within the partnerships team as well as the customer success team at Udemy. So kind of have have dual aspect there uh, in terms of experience, but looking forward to uh, today's discussion. Thanks, guys. And um, they'll be on the chat for any questions you guys want to want to bring out there. Okay, so um, what we're going to do, as there's three areas around this, right? There's an area around creation, and our partners will talk to that, as well as Ryan, an area around consumption and curation. And, and this is a hugely interesting moment for the industry. Um, there's no doubt that AI is allowing us to innovate. Probably what feels like a year of innovation is more like 10 years of innovation going on right now. So hopefully what we're going to see today is the different dimensions that impact content creation and learning experiences from those four different areas, right? So those four different areas where we take our content from, uh, one is from some of the library vendors, which Udemy obviously is a, one of the great ones, um, from internal learning professional teams using tools such as Easy Generator, so right at the, the forefront of content creation and using AI to do some special things at the show today. Um, obviously, external agencies and obviously our team, such as Ryan leads a great team, which is that external agency. We can talk about how our AI is impacting the way they create content. And at the same time, uh, user generated content, that crowd created content, we're utilizing more and more AI. But in the middle of that, obviously, sits platforms that can do some wonderful new things uh, that allows us to reconsider um, how we think about learning experience from a curation and consumption perspective. Um, so what we're going to focus on first, though, before we get into the creation and consumption side, we're going to ask Ryan McBride to come in and just ask, you know, from that professional content creation piece, Ryan, um, I'd love you to talk us through how you're starting to be able to utilize AI over the last six months to create, I guess, high quality content in a faster way and a more inclusive way. Yeah, definitely. So over the six months, it's changed our approach to content creation rapidly. And at the very core of what we do, if you go to the next slide, please, Steve, is the Fuse formula. So when we're creating content for our customers, we are quite smart, but we're not experts in the field of every um, organization that we work with. So what we do is we find the expert within an organization, 
we capture them digitally. So we shoot them, we capture their audio or capture them on camera. Then what we do is we take that journalistic interview back to base, cut out all of the mistakes. And, and through the power of brain friendly animation, we add active imagery to reinforce the learning objectives and heightened engagement. And we really encourage our customers to move from books to what we call a bite-sized approach. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Thanks, I just Steve. want to say I love your button and greatness uh, imagery on the right. Thank side. you. These images are made by AI, guys. It took me five minutes. So. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think what I want to talk through is just some of the practical things that we're utilising that can hopefully help you guys. That is definitely making us get more time back to be more creative, do more work, um, mostly be more creative. I'm very passionate about that. But the the main one is that we've been using is the ability to use AI to clone the subject matter expert's voice. So if we were to do a sales enablement program, for example, where we would go and shoot 10 to sometimes 25 videos in a day with quite important subject matter experts, um, their time is very important to them. Whereas if we take that back to base and um, or they don't like necessarily how they came across or a policy or procedure has changed, what we would have to do is book time in with that uh, individual again, get my team, camera team, all of that stuff, traveling, all of those things that take up loads and loads of time, but we don't have to do that anymore. So what we can do with their permission is, is we can take a clear sample of their voice, analyze that, and then reproduce that into any um, sentences or wording that we need. So we're saving loads and loads of time with the voice generation piece, which is very, very powerful. If you go to the next slide, please, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, and, and just hit that point. So I'm guessing this solves one of the problems that you have around um, capturing experts, right? Which is availability of, of an expert where you go there, you cap, you might even fly out, get the team to fly out and actually do that magic piece where you do where you're interviewing an expert. You've captured loads of great stuff, but then you realize there's one or two little tiny things you want to do. And whether that's an actor or whether that's the expert, then you, this, I guess the AI cloning bit is now you to now solve that problem of, still allowing you to shoot that that expertise but not having to have that concern and worry about what happens if something changes yes big time i'm a lot more confident when we leave as opposed to thinking that we may have to reshoot exactly the other way which we're utilizing ai especially with the scoping of the the learning that we deliver to our customers is using generative ai to understand significant amounts of information so our bread and butter essentially is evolving people's existing material into more engaging bite-sized pieces of content. Usually the existing material that they have is really big slide decks or PowerPoint presentations or old PDFs and things like that. Whereas what would the team and I would have to do beforehand was, if I use the example of a two-day workshop, we would have to, in essence, attend a two-day workshop to understand that information. Whereas what we can do now with generative AI is we can take those slides or that information, pump it into there and ask questions of that uh, data. So we can ask for the key learning objectives. We can ask for a deconstructions. We can brainstorm with the AI as well, which is fantastic if you're having a bit of a creative block. But um, what we're able to do then is reduce the time it takes to us to scope um, pieces of material. Also enables us to deliver proposals or treatments faster to our customers and also rapid knowledge acquisition. And as you can see, I've got an AI image of Neo there, but what I thought of was um, the famous scene where he says, where he plugs himself in and he says, I know Kung Fu, where what we're able to do is understand massive amounts of information far, far quicker than we did previously. And just hit that point there, Ryan, because I guess one of the things that I've seen you do over the years, right, is in order to interview an expert to extract out, because one of the things I guess your team does is, and this has enabled us to do it for few school, um, is this technique where instead of scripting most of the stuff, you are using live audio as the raw, as the, I guess, the source of truth, right? So you're interviewing an expert, taking a you know, half an hour interview, and then and then post-producing that into a three, four minute um, clip, or maybe a 30 second clip for our TikTok friends. Uh, um, uh, but to, I guess, for you to ask the right questions to extract out the story that you want to do, one of the things you've got to do is actually bring yourself up to speed in advance of that knowledge. So what you're saying here is using AI, that summarization ability, the ability to synthesize all that different workshop knowledge, video knowledge and so forth into a succinct way that you can bring yourself up to speed reduces what that that by 
from 75 percent is that fair? Uh, I'm, I'm i'm saving a ridiculous amount of time if you think uh, i would historically or in the past sometimes i would actually have to go and attend a two-day workshop so then you're obviously looking for me people want me to do stuff at work whereas what i can do now is in an hour or so i could be brought up to speed and then i can even brainstorm with the generative ai tell it what i'm doing what i'm learning now is the more you give it the more you get out of it but uh explaining that we are want to produce journalistic passionate extract passionate concise messages from subject matter experts it enables me to brainstorm the the questions that we're going to ask and it's just making my life far far easier steve got it so scripting aside i think um scripting was or generative ai especially for text and copy and stuff like that was the first sort of wave as I like to think about it and as much as we like to encourage organizations to not script content because we believe in extracting passionate uh, messages from individuals there are instances where we do have to script content say if we're working with a legal team or policies and procedures and stuff like that but um, using generative AI for scripting uh, helps us again with speed increase efficiency we're able to automate tasks significantly reducing production time where we're able to have enhanced customization. So we're able to generate personalized content for specific audiences, which is really, really important because we don't want to alienate specific target audiences with the material or the scripted material that we're crafting. Uh, improved consistency. This one's really, really important. What I did the other day actually was when I was scoping some marketing material for a customer, I was able to provide the brand guidelines, the tone, look and feel, a tone of voice into the generative AI. And then I was able to work on the scripts, but it understood the look and feel of the business. So that was able to do that a lot faster. And the content I was producing was getting signed off by the internal marketing team far quicker than it would be historically. And also again, the speed, but scalability, we're able to rapidly produce large volumes of content without compromising on quality as well. So it's really, really helping us for the scripted content that we have to produce. And just uh, just again, the thing to help for the audience, right? A lot of your focus is on is video content creation versus um, traditional kind of e-learning, right? So worth that yeah. in that point because that's relative to, I guess, the how you're using AI for that particular type of output. But yeah, mm, thanks. And my most favorite AI that I'm using currently at the moment is called Mid Journey. Um, I'm not sure some people probably definitely would have heard of it. It can be quite fiddly to work with. I actually spoke to a couple of members of my team and a customer today. So off the back of this webinar, I will be making a video about how to use Midjourney. But what we're able to do is, it's an image generation tool, but we're able to produce high quality, visually appealing thumbnails that attract attention. That's where I've been using it predominantly with thumbnail generation. Uh, all of my slides here are produced in Midjourney. And as you can see at the bottom, these are some of the thumbnails that we've been making as well. Whereas beforehand we would obviously need a designer to you know and that could take like a day to do that material uh, produce that thumbnail for us but now what we're able to do and what i've been learning loads especially with the prompt engineering aspect of mid journey is i'm able to make very very specific images which speeds up the entire process and then with you to it's still not 100 percent though a lot of the time we have to utilize our design team to add relevant text and stuff like that. That's the only thing that I've noticed with the image generation stuff. It's not it's not there with text yet. And the big thing that we're doing for customers in relation to translation is behind the scenes, we are fusing four different AIs together to reduce the costs and enhance inclusivity, allowing people to learn in their mother tongue and experience the benefits of personalized education. So I've got an example about um, from a project we've recently done for Levy, which is a massive um, company in America that provides all of the food and drinks and beverages to baseball games and American football games and stuff like that. They're in the UK as well. And they really pride themselves on the Levy way of doing things. So they had a, an array of subject matter experts, long standing subject matter experts that had been there a long time. Obviously, because they're based all over the world, we want to get the levy way to everyone. But what we're going to be able to do soon is, as you can see here on the left, we interviewed one of the subject matter experts in English. But you'll be able to, at the click of a button, I need Steve to do the, the example here, guys. Los subcontratistas so son empresas externas, marcas locales o nacionales. And then we could translate uh, either way from Spanish straight to English as well with the click of a button. If you could show the English example as well, Steve. 
those subcontractors are external businesses. Um, so just explaining, maybe you could just explain what your team did to go from literally English to Spanish for those hundred odd videos. So what we did is Magnus utilized an AI to understand the uh, audio or the transcript within that information. And then we're able to translate it and obviously save our customers a significant amount of money considering. Yeah. So in essence, basically what we, I guess what Magnus did is press one, press the button. And then that, that content goes literally uh, in five minutes, those 80 videos, or I think in about an hour, you press one button and within an hour, what you've got is automated 100 videos in in Spanish, um, without having to do any work any work in between of that. So yeah, which is which is a huge huge comparison to how it used to be. You know, we used to have um, we used to collaborate with third party organisations. We had to get checked sometimes. Back in the day, we'd be utilising students to check our transcripts, generating all of our subtitles and embedding them in um, to the content themselves. So this is. Yeah, no, quite amazing, I think, really. <laughs> I think it's just a quick question. So, Heather, and then we'll check on to the next bit. So, so yeah, his, what we are touched on is the quality level is so much more improved that unless it's like kind of, um, I, I guess, hyper compliance level training. So, for example, for example, for Fuse School of Charity, we pretty much put the videos out there straight. The only thing we're finding it gets a little bit wrong is company specific language, but it's now possible to embed custom dictionaries into that. So it picks that up stuff as well. But we'll cover that a little bit more. But um Appreciate that, Ryan. And let, let me just jump into the into the next um, uh, part towards it. And, and it's great to kind of hit that bit around the, the content bit first. And I want to kind of jump into consumption as, as a part, right? So, um, and before I do that, let's just a quick poll. Um, and uh, Armin's going to set the poll up for us. And I want to ask a question to you guys that outside of work, when you want to learn something, um, what is the, go for it. Yeah. What is the way you, your your preference is it ChatGPT? Is it Google? Is it Udemy? Is it TikTok? Is it that the old library, you know, that I, I went to as a kid, my mum took me to? I had to explain to Armand what a library was um, with books. It's they, They're still there. It was how I used to like learn like, on a Saturday afternoon with my mum. Um, yeah. So it's still, it's still, it's still, it's still got a Okay. So Armand's like TikTok. And Armand's actually explained to me um, actually how she learns everything on TikTok. I mean, so that's generational part there. I was kind of still on YouTube and I think my mum's on Facebook. Um, so how are we doing? How are we doing? Um, oh, let me do one. Let me do it. Where is my go-to now? Probably my go Is it go? Probably, I think. Oh, host them. We can't vote. Bummer. Okay, so how are we doing? Let's have a look. So uh, we've got Google number one. Uh, we've got YouTube number two. We've got ChatGPT company number three, which is really interesting because that probably wouldn't have been there a year ago. TikTok number four. I think we've got 1% for the library. We do have a library. And... Uh, Oh, don't tell Ross, but Udemy uh, linked him slightly ahead of linked the Udemy. I, I just keep that quiet. Moving on, moving on. And but TikTok trumps both of them. Um, so I think I think super interesting, guys. Let's move move on from that. I think again to the point. I think that um, the way we learn is obviously changing, right? And it's changing because of these consumer technologies are coming in and design wise. There's things that come in that impact it. Same question, maybe a year ago, Google would have been far out number one. I don't think we would have seen ChatGPT in the, in the list, YouTube number two, but now we're finding these different modalities of learning, right? So from I search for an answer to I'm having conversation to I'm watching stuff, the length of the modality, whether it's, you know, for me, a five minute video is fine. For so Armin, it's like, take, no, no, way too long, five minutes, right? 30 seconds max, otherwise I tune out. But all these things are, you know, are hyper interesting. Um, I think, again, if you look at traditional e-learning, they're pretty much, you know, traditional e-learning is pretty much that single learning modality, right? So lots of text, uh, a next button, on to, and some maybe some quizzes that go through towards it. So as instructional designers, learning designers, we're designing learning predominantly for one way of learning. I'm not sure who one way that is, though, uh, but it's definitely for, for one way of learning. I never actually managed to get through one of these courses, even though I had a company that was designing them all. Um, I think, again, if we take what um, some of what Ryan was talking about and this move from these designing learning from books to bite size, the first thing we get there from a consumption perspective is we're able to consume that in maybe three different approaches. One is we can take, in that case of the Levy example Ryan mentioned, they can be put into structured learning, into onboarding, injected with activities, um, quizzes, knowledge checks, and all those wonderful things, um, either wrapped in a traditional SCORM course or run outside of that in a more Udemy style of, style of content um, inside Fuse, um, in kind of our formal learning plan, and that's one way. Or the second way is we can uh, access that, access in a more YouTube style fashion, 
or TikTok. Um, uh, find the video in the point of need and go through that. And the third way that happens because of AI now inside Fuse is all the, all the text inside those videos are transcribed and put into the corporate brain. And we can now interact with that and ask questions and have conversations with the content itself. So I think what's really interesting is we're now designing content um, in one way and we're hitting it in three consumption ways rather than that traditional one way. But if I add on to that, it's actually multiple modalities as well, right? So the old way of learning pretty much is I'm reading text in one modality. But if we take some of the examples that Ryan's used, uh, which is I'm making that those videos, then those videos by default inside a platform like Fuse is automatically available in at least five different modalities. So I can watch the person you know, in the restaurant making that mojito in the, in the perfect way. I can listen to them. I can listen to them at different speeds. You might want to slow my speed down. You might want to speed up other people's speeds depending upon um, their level of neurodiversity and stuff as well. Um, at the same time, because it creates a, a hyper accurate script, then some people may want to read that. Um, some people may want to socially interact with it. They want to chat with the author of the content, which is a piece underneath that. And then obviously the newer piece now coming through to the platform is that ability to actually talk, not with a person, but talk with the collective knowledge that the platform has and all those, those 50 experts together that consolidated. So there's a big difference now between that old way of single modality to building content in one way, but actually allowing us to have five different modalities come out. And then as we, we'll talk about, personalize it even more. I think there's a question come out here from, uh, uh, no, I think we got that one. I think, I think uh, uh, Ryan's gonna answer that one, I think in the, in the chat. Um, so just bre and breach and just, I guess, pulling out that last one, which was that um, this new mod new modality of conversations with the platform. So, you know, Fuse is like my fourth baby. Um, and it's now lovely that I can now talk to it. Um, so this capability now where we can, all the, all the information, the text inside articles, the transcripts and the text that people say is all built into this, this brain. So in the case of the example, they said that Ryan presented the, at the beginning, there might be 20 or 30 different experts that makes up that body of knowledge. And the conversations that we're now having through and um, through the platform now allows us to, um, to ask questions and have conversations you can see on the screen here, which is automatically only talking to the experts in the business. And at the same time, it is um, understanding more about the individual. So it knows the preferred language you want to talk in. It knows your job role. It knows the communities you're in. And it knows, and it's more and more, we're adding more information towards it. So we're personalizing that conversation to the individual. Um, so a really interesting part, I think, as we, as we, as we move from single modality, creating content from the single modality, to we're creating content automatically for multiple modalities. So to hit the next point, which, in, which I guess accelerates that part around creating um, and consuming in a more inclusive way. So again, if we look at, um, I guess, learning modalities, a lot of people say this concept of learning visually or auditory and, and so forth doesn't really exist. But as a person that is neurodiverse, so um, as an ADHD person, um, I definitely learn like to learn in a, a more bite-sized style way um, and, and probably more visual and probably more auditory than I want to read. And if I have to read, I'll, I'll read, but I don't necessarily want to read a 50 page manual because that's not, not the way my brain's wired. Likewise for a dyslexic person, the same type of thing, it's not going to be great for that dyslexic person to be forced to read, you know, a, a next, next, next style course. Um, but other people, perhaps more autistic and people with autism are going to probably like a structured way of, of doing anything we're out there. So definitely what we want to be doing is considering different modalities of learning and high, and dynamically personalize the experience um, around each individual, whether they're neurodiverse or whether they're not neurodiverse. And again, one of the things that we've hit on uh, briefly is the, the advances in AI that's allowing us to do certain things. So one of those things, for example, is the acceleration and the innovation around transcription and translation. So for example, recently we just changed our transcription engine from one that was pretty accurate, 98% accurate, to something now that is like 99.9% .9 accurate towards that. And likewise, we're seeing the same with the translation part. So we are seeing a huge range of innovation towards accuracy. And it is key, right? Because the accuracy of the transcription creates that corporate brain. It allows obviously people that prefer to read 
which includes people that have, you know, accessibility issues like our chief product officer, Reese. you know, he is, he's deaf. So he does love to read stuff in transcripts and subtitles as well as watch. Um, so the accuracy piece is absolutely a key inclusivity piece um, for multiple reasons in terms of that. Um, and I think, again, I'm not going to go through the demo, but that was uh, apart from the fact that it is my cute kid who's now um, is doing part of our so, videos. The value of a digit depends. He's teaching maths on a YouTube channel, but he's not teaching in English. He's now. He's now teaching in Hindi as well, which I love. Uh, um, and a click of a button, he can teach in any language, which is totally cool. Um, oh, he's very keen as well. So we keep going through. And and, what, and I think the journey for this, right, is continuous that what the, the journey for us and I think for others over the next six months, 12 months, will be just using other capabilities to increase that level of personalization. So from uh, whether it's newer diversity, preferred learning language, preferred um, learning level or age, all those type of things we can use now to start inputting and, and creating that side. The last bit before I pass over to the Udemy and the Easy Generator guys is just talking about curation. So, so far we talked about um, the consumption piece and a little bit about curation beginning. I just want to finish off with some stuff around uh, curation inside here. Um, so if we look at, I guess, the first part we're going to look at here, which is um, the ability to create content is now done in multiple ways. And one of the first things we see outside there is there are different ways to tag different content. So Udemy has its content taxonomy and skills taxonomy, which we'll talk to. Harvard has its. Fuse might be using Lightcast or something else. So again, that does create some type of a challenge when you have a, when you have all those different ways and you want to be able to get the right content to the right person based on that individual. So one of the big things that's now happening and for products like ours is we are um, consolidating in all of that data from different places that allows us to personalize the experience for an individual even more to create different experiences. So for example, when we connect to Udemy, we will bring all the metadata that Udemy can offer up. Everything it possibly can have around the title, description, the tags, the length of the course, all that information, likewise from any other provider that we take on board. And what we are now doing from October, also bringing all that learning activity. So uh, the course completions they've done uh, and other data that we're gonna take and that gets stored also into our, into our data pool. Likewise, you know, historically, we've always bring in any data we can about the job role, the language, the preferences, potentially skills gaps that exist on the HR platform. And also now, uh, as of this quarter, adding in more data, more and more data around um, the, the day to day activities, what they're liking, what they're ignoring, what they're watching. And all of that builds up a model for both the content and individuals to allow us to do something quite similar um, to YouTube. So if you look at what YouTube or TikTok, um, does inside of there. What it's using is lots of different signals. Traditionally, we would use about 20 signals to try to recommend content in Fuse. YouTube probably use about 200. The switch now with Fuse now using similar type of uh, machine learning and allowing us to have a far richer set of data of different places allows us now to hyper-personalize and to use that data going forward to curate even more intelligently than we were before. And when we think about that curation, the way we want to we want to use that is in, and we are using it today and uh, becoming more sophisticated going forward, is in the use of different different feeds. So, for example, feeds to allow people to learn every day and to feed them information about their job, their role, and information around that. Feeds around curiosity to allow to pull people back into the platform because actually this is more your you know, edutainment style content that's going to try to get you to be interested and, and pull back to your skills parts, to aid in your career progression. So looking at all that content you're gonna have from a Udemy or a Harvard and a Fuse or another LMS and how do we use all of that to make sure that you're learning the next thing to up your career. And obviously, you know, the, all the traditional stuff we're, we're still having inside there, such as that compliance side. So different feeds and different ways of surfacing in an automated way and how AI is using curation, the part I wanna get through here. So let me park, I'm gonna jump onto chat. And um, over to you for us um, to show us how authoring tools like Easy Generator are really taking things to the next level in that part. Thanks, Steve. Look forward to it. So uh, what I would like to do first is just take a step back and remind everyone of, uh, let's say, an ideal e-learning strategy, right? So it includes bespoke content creation, where Ryan and the amazing team are creating these fantastic uh, pieces of content using AI. Then we have, of course, the likes of Udemy with off-the-shelf um, and then we have internal course creation for company specific trainings. And that's where I would love to focus on for today and, and how AI is impacting 
that part. However, saying that, a lot of what Ryan said is what I will be saying in terms of benefits. So a lot of what he experienced as a benefit of someone who is creating these courses or content is what our customers are also seeing as a benefit um, of using AI. So um, it, it will be extremely similar from that perspective, but let's jump in um, to the first slide. So um, I'm quite a mathematical person myself, so I would love to have a very mathematical approach as much as I can for analyzing a certain topic. And, and here, what I would love to do is, you know, we have AI and, and all the buzz around it, but in, in reality, I would say the two most prominent or perhaps even one most prominent benefit of it or impact of it is speed, right? It's just undeniable that you were not able to create a course as fast as you can do now and probably as accurate as you can do now. So, um, and easy. So speed and ease of use, I would say, would be the, the two most important elements here. And that, of course, comes with a set number of features, right? So in a bulk of features allow you to do that. However, um, those features and the, the introduction of AI is also allowing for a positive cultural change in terms of how companies would go about internal course creation, whereas uh, prior to AI, it was predominantly just L&D doing everything from zero to 100, whereas now with the inclusion of AI, we are seeing more and more companies feeling confident giving part or an entire course to a subject matter expert to, to take part in and actually create uh, and I'm going to go over uh, the features now. So maybe we can start with the next slide, which is the course builder. So um, it is exactly as you think it is, as the name suggests. It allows you to build a course using AI. So as you can see in this GIF that I'm um, showing right now, you're able to give AI a few prompts. And the prompts are simple. What kind of course do you want to create? What is the audience? How lengthy do you want the course to be? So you can indeed, as Steve said, go for a more bite-sized approach, go for a regular or a, a bit lengthier, of course. Um, however, as you also just saw, saw right now and the document being dragged in, um, you are able to now also use your own documents and feed the AI and say, you know what, instead of going and, and searching the web um, to get the information that I would love in, in case, for example, I wanna create a course for new people that are joining the Dutch office, and I want to you know, create a course about the Netherlands and the benefits of working there, I would then use the documents that I already have. Um, and, and ideally that allows me to make this even more of a company specific course. And if I look at the journey that we took, so we were um, perhaps one of the earliest uh, authoring tools that actually went with the AI uh, back at uh, Learning Technologies 2023. And from there, I'm seeing more and more of, of like how fast we're improving and how fast AI is improving. So. Even a few months ago, the course builder that you're seeing right now did not allow you to add documents and be accurate about it. Now you can do that. Uh, end of this quarter, you're able to not only feed it documents, but also allow the images of those documents to be fully imported into these courses, image generation. So I've, I've noticed a lot of, your, your, uh, of, of the people here were writing to Ryan asking about what kind of AI do you use? And there were multiple tools there. Um, a lot of them are actually then available inside each generator. So that's uh, often one of the questions that I get asked, like, hey, why would I need each generator to do that if I can just go to ChatGPT and do another tool and another tool to get that done? Because they're just um, available uh, for you inside one tool. So you're not going to have the tool for it. It's just going to be a lot faster. So the course builder here is uh, an amazing new addition to allow you to create these courses a lot faster. So again, focus on speed and then ease of use. But that's not where it ends. There are other elements to the AI as well. So let's uh, move forward. And uh, yeah, we would love to say, if you can use a computer, you can create e-learning um, courses now and keep them engaging. And that's really the power of what we call easy AI, which is our uh, branded version of AI. And, and these days, every company has that. But let's discover that in more details and what that easy AI means in reality. So let's uh, go to the next one. Perfect. Thanks, Steve. So here, um, the focus is on four elements. So outside of the, so next to the course builder, uh, we have the chat, the summarize, the simplify, and generate questions. And my two personal favorites and the ones that I've seen people use uh, most often would be the chat and generate questions. Um, the chat allows you to uh, not really be bothered by the fact that you don't have a lot of uh, info at the, the tip of your uh, fingertips, or actually you're not able to you know, find information easier. Just ask chat uh, about something that you want to get more information. It will provide it to you. And with a click of a button, you're able to move that inside these generators. So you're not leaving the tool at all. 
uh, in order to do that. Then you're able to do a number of things to the text that you just moved in, right? So you can summarize it, you can create bullet points, you can simplify it, or my favorite, you can actually generate questions. And as you can see, this whole thing is significantly faster and easier uh, to do rather than doing all of that manually. Uh, you know, Steve was asking a question about where do you get your information and ChatGPT was the third, right? So and I'm expecting that to go up and up in that uh, ladder. Um, you know, instead of going to Google, searching for it, copy and pasting it, taking care of that, you know, ugly setup of copy paste and then trying to find an image and then trying to, to go through it and trying to summarize it, bullet points, generate questions, all of that manual task is then done now by the easy AI. Um, and that also not only allows the L&D to, to enjoy a very quick content creation, but actually the people in the business who carry the knowledge for these specific internal course creations can be very much in the play. Like uh, not only it is as easy for, for them to, to get started, but also it takes away another concern that often is associated with that cultural change, which is quality of these courses. So a lot of this is then heavily influenced by the accuracy and the quality of AI, and that's getting better and better. So naturally, the culture would then be a lot easier to adopt. There's another layer to this as well, which um, Ryan and the, the team also mentioned, which is translation. So if we go forward, you're also able to, of course, after you know creating that course, adding more to it based on what I've showed you before. You can also just go ahead and translate it into multiple languages. And translation comes in two levels. So you have the actual text translation, right? Which you can do in, in plus 75. And actually now it's even more um, languages. And uh, the accuracy is it's insanely good. Of course, the more, let's say, rare languages you want to try, uh, you would have less of a accuracy. But in the end, it is what it should be for our customers to adopt. But you also, of course, have things like text-to-speech, uh, which not only takes into account the language that you want the, the text to be spoken, but also the uh, intonation and, and certain details that matter when you want to give that true, authentic feeling to a full localization course. So to wrap it up, you create a course using your own doc. So you started with a document, and you end up with a multilingual course that is fully localized. And, and that's not not something they should take for granted. It's just that easy and quick to take care of all of that. Steve, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, and I think again, I think there's a some rationale, right, where we start to partner with each other because, um, again, we, we we can't build everything, right, right. And if you did, would be bad. So we're obviously very keen from a few sides to continue on our journey around AI tools for the uh, the, the crowd, if you like, so the the, the non learning professionals, experts, authors, and so forth, which you're laser focused in. But the reason, the thing that I think we really liked about the relationship, right, is um, things that we think are really important. Uh, as we we're covered earlier on, are things like AI translation, which we love the fact that's embedded in the product. And the second thing is the fact that we can access the content from your courses and actually be able to put that into that AI brain, which then allows us that multimodality learning capability. So the ability to socially interact, the ability to ask questions and all those type of things as well. So yeah, I, I think from our side, um, it's great to, you know, there's always gonna need, need to build courses, but I think building courses that allows flexibility um, is what's, you know, allow, it has to be the way forward, I think, rather than um, be non-inclusive, uh, which is, uh, I think, the world we want to move away from. Yeah, 100%. Uh, you're spot on. The, the AI story with us um, is, you know, throughout the whole process, like from the content creation to the consumption, and both are, are equally important here. So, yep. Um, Back to you, Steve. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, no, that was great. Uh, you want to add something else? But, no, yeah. no, no, I think well, it, let's um, wrap it up towards the end and we get everyone to contribute. But I think that was a great overview. And I think at this stage here, what we'd love now to do is to give uh, Ross an opportunity uh, to take us through what Udemy is doing in the world of AI and um, and the technologies and tools you're coming to market with. Over to yes. Ross. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. Um, so hi everybody. Um, yeah, looking forward to to kind of getting into the detail in the next next ten minutes or so. So if we jump onto the next slide, um, uh, like so far, I found this very kind of interesting as well. Hearing hearing everything from like the content creation side, I suppose when I think about it, and maybe from a Udemy perspective in general, we're naturally thinking if uh, about AI and and learning from a a consumption side. Okay. Um, for anybody who's not aware, Udemy.com is a learning learning marketplace with over 200,000 courses, okay, taught by approximately 75,000 instructors from around the world. Um, if we click on to the next slide, 
the key thing that I kind of wanted to use this time for was to really kind of explain, okay, well, yes, Udemy is a learning marketplace, okay? And on that marketplace, there's a huge amount of content about Gen AI, but really today's conversation is about explaining, okay, well, how is Udemy and Udemy business leveraging AI to make the learning experience more tangible and more kind of effective? So if we click, uh, there's a couple of builds here. So if we click once, and then you can go ahead and just fill that semicircle. You'll see each one is a click. Um, but as kind of to, to my point a moment ago, really what we want to be sure that we are doing, and 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 some of this exists today, okay, and and, and I'll highlight the, the areas of, of focus or the aspirational areas, which some features are in beta at the moment. But we can see here that we really want to make sure that Gen AI within our Udemy business platform, which is our enterprise solution for organizations, each aspect of the, the, the platform is touched by Gen AI. Okay, so whether that be in terms of learning guidance, which is, of course, you know, really the kind of user experience when it comes to trying to understand, well, what is the relevant content for me on a given topic or how should I engage with a certain topic? You know, having the platform kind of uh, supply and recommend you, you, you key content is important there. Secondly, around learning modalities, we've certainly heard about that so far today, that idea of, you know, sharing between uh, read content, written content, uh, audible content, and, and being able to kind of meet people where they are and ensure that your learning experience might be slightly to my learning experience and to, you know, to ensure that it's effective regardless of, of maybe the individual attempting to, to learn on a given topic. Um, the third item here, the interactive learning, I think that's that's kind of a key theme within within today's today's conversation as well as is really saying, OK, well, it's one thing, for example, um, you know, signing into Udemy business or, or coming through Fuse and, and accessing a Udemy business course and watching a video and kind of, you know, absorbing that information. But, you know, it's a, it's a whole other thing to be able to say, OK, well, as I learn, as I'm engaging with this video content, um, what happens if I have a question? What happens if I need a bit more clarity or I need a kind of a summation of a topic within that that course? Up until now, or up until recently, you know, that hasn't really been possible in a, in a lot of kind of learning environments. Whereas now, as we begin to fold in Gen AI, there is that 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 ability to actually begin kind of questioning the the actual content and receiving kind of kind of clarity on on, on those questions. So we'll get into that more in a moment. But I think that's that's kind of a key piece. And then finally, in terms of validation, our focus certainly moving forward, especially within more technical teams, when we talk about um, you know, IT and engineering, there's always that sense of how do we validate skills? How do we ensure that, um, you know, if people are attempting to uh, achieve certain uh, certifications, how do we ensure they get to the level whereby they can pass first time on each of those courses? So, you know, having that level of validation and ensuring that the correct content is recommended to individuals on their journey of learning is going to be key to making sure that they, you know, increase level by level to where they need to be. And then finally, in terms of insights again, so that kind of wraps everything up in terms of providing, okay, well, based on all of, let's say, your employees' uh, engagements on Udemy Business and the types of content, uh, whether it be kind of long form, short form, bite-sized or full courses, be able to provide that insight back to, let's say, L&D teams so that they can understand the approaches taken by their employee base so that they can better create learning paths so that they can better create learning programs, um, which is, you know, ultimately what underpins a lot of these conversations. Um, if we go ahead and click on, um, there's, I think, two more clicks maybe. It's really just to kind of highlight that, okay, well, all of that exists. And there's one more click to go. All of that exists within the Udemy business platform, but really that is to, you know, exist on its own, but then to be able to integrate with other, other um, platforms and organizations, in this case, similar to, to Fuse. For example, if, you know, if, if, if that integration is there, if you and your employees were to log in via Fuse and access you doing business content, all of that information is kind of being shared back and forth. And it's really, that boils down to, to improve the overall user experience, because that's what, you know, that's really what this conversation is about is how do we get to a stage or continuously improve upon how individuals can learn? How do we make sure that the effort to create learning paths and create learning programs is is minimized while the output is maximized. That's really what we're here to do. Um, so I think that's that's kind of a key part of our focus as well, is really connecting platforms, you know, that leverage Gen AI along with other technologies to really make sure that those learning experiences are, are, are increasingly effective. Um, that kind of kind of highlights maybe at a, at a high level or a bird's eye view kind of where we are and where we're trying to get to. Um, 
the, the, the next couple of slides I have and we can click on is really just to, to kind of, you know, zoom in a touch on, okay, well, how, how will some of that exactly work in terms of the, you know, these items or these features, which are in beta, which are hopefully uh, going to come out before, before the end of this year. Uh, currently some of our, our customers are, are helping provide feedback, but for example, if we zoom in on, on, on this idea of an AI assistant, this is really exists within that idea of interactive learning. And if you can imagine, as I explained a moment ago, you know, while you're actually in the throes of learning, as you're going through um, video content, kind of understanding and, and digesting a concept, you will naturally have questions. And the, the ability for you as a learner to be able to, you know, essentially do what we all did growing up as kids, put your hand up in the classroom and ask a question to an AI, which has a full knowledge of the course content, which will be able to provide you in real time a response to that question is going to help people learn more effectively. And, you know, as mentioned a moment ago, that's really what this is all about is how do people learn more effectively, less time wasted, kind of clicking buttons and, and kind of watching screens in, in kind of a, a you know, a, a potentially zombie fashion if they're not actually absorbing that, that information. So how do we always make that more effective? I think this is going to be huge um, in terms of ensuring that people stay and remain more engaged on content on the Udemy site. Um, and yeah, really excited for this to, to, to go GA and be, a, be be available to everybody. And then the oh, that's just an example of how it'll look in actual kind of real time. You'll be able to essentially see your content on the left, type your, your prompts on the right, and everything will appear on that right hand kind of uh, blank space there to, to, to inform the, the learner. So concept of time, I know we have kind of 10 minutes for Q&A and discussion at the end, but the very last slide I did want to highlight here is in the same kind of vein as having that, that um, AI assistant within the content or as people learn, that, that same kind of approach is going to be taken if we kind of zoom out from the learner level to more of, let's say, the admin level or maybe the L&D team or, or, or kind of um, specific department management. If you think about the kind of organization's needs, okay? Um, thinking about, okay, well, maybe what is our, you know, our, our, our uh, focus, like key, uh, key skill gaps maybe for the year or, you know, how do we want to approach the year? Naturally, there will be learning programs that, that people are going to build out. And I'm sure many people on the call have spent lots of time kind of coming up with those plans and then executing upon those plans, thinking this is going to take time and effort. I hope nothing really changes in the meantime um, before we get this kind of to, to, to the actual employee base, but naturally things change. So really what we, what we are, are kind of suggesting and bringing to market here is the ability to use AI to more quickly create learning paths and uh, to essentially prompt the system and say, look, we need a learning path for this topic, which touches on each of these key subtopics. And from there, it'll have the ability to spin up an actual learning path for you, which you could then edit and augment for your specific employee base. So again, reducing that time uh, and, and effort associated with actually building plans and programs. Okay, so more to come on that, but uh, certainly exciting to, to, to see that rolled out too. Back to you, Steve, I think you're muted. People have been trying to do that for years. Um, just in my real life, just find a button that does that. Uh, um, <laughs> no, I really, really appreciate that. And there's a, a question maybe coming in. And then I may, maybe actually what I might just do as well is for those that maybe haven't seen it on this webinar, actually just show some of that kind of, you know, that live conversational um, chat type stuff going into it. So for example, if I actually now just reshare my screen and then I want to answer a couple of questions um, to the panel. But if, for example, this is just on, for those clients of ours looking at our internal version of Fuse, and I can, for example, I don't know, ask the questions such as, you know, what is a, a learning plan um, uh, inside Fuse here? Um, and, and inside here, it's a little bit different to uh, what came through here, because obviously in our bit, we're using that kind of Google type thing, which is it's able to figure out in the main search bar at the top, was that a question or actually was that a resource you're, you're after and it's switching automatically? And to that bit, that follow up then conversation bit. So, so for us, this obviously is all the content created. And I think to the point of the question and obviously that follow up conversational type style thing inside there. But I wanted to hit that just because I wanted to hit this question from Samir, which was, on the user generated part, I'm just reading from the side. Um, uh, 
which is interesting profile. I look like um, Johnny Bravo from this angle. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> uh, it says on the generated, you have something like a corporate brain of feud, which over a period of time uploading different documents. So yeah, exactly that. So Samir. So in essence, and this is maybe where the difference between our relationship with Udemy versus relationship with Easy Generator. So with Easy Generator, the plan is for us to extract out all of the content uh, that's inside Easy Generator, as well as obviously content that's directly created in Fuse um, from videos, transcripts, documents, so forth. So that in essence creates the Fuse corporate brain. And that, what you saw on the screen there, that ability to have a conversation with that from the main search bar, it will be constant. And then obviously when you're going through a course, similar to Udemy, little pop-up on the right, there's gonna be more context sensitive to that in our UX refresh that starts to get rolled out in Q4 this year. Um, with Udemy, obviously at the moment, we never know what changes, right? But at the moment, the APIs that we get from Udemy allow us to bring all the metadata. So we get the titles, descriptions, tags, all that type of stuff to add into our index and, and make it smart. But we don't yet, hopefully it might change, you never know, but we don't get into the actual transcript of the knowledge. So the, the part which uh, Ross showed around um, their AI support system would be specific to their content. We at the moment just have the metadata. We don't get into the content of that. With Easy Generator, though, we will do that. We will be able to get access into the content. So for that company-specific course knowledge, um, if somebody's you know, built around company products and you use Easy Generator products, then yeah, that, that definitely is where we're going with that, Samir, and help you with that piece. That was a lot there. So um, uh, just want to make sure we got a little bit of time, maybe uh, reflections from, um, well, actually, first of all, you want to make sure before I yabber on, because you know that with my ADHD, I can just talk for a couple of days and stop. Um, any other questions that want to come in uh, before, we, before we pass off to the, um, the panel to ask a, questions, a few questions of each other? Let's have a little look. We still managed to maintain a great audience towards the end, and we still got, how many minutes left do we have? Eight minutes left, perfect. Okay, so a little time at the end. So uh, maybe a question then from me to you guys, right? So everything, some of what you've seen is new to you guys. One of the things I think is is a challenge, right, for an l and professional. You're sitting in the customer side and you've got all of this type of stuff. You know, what's, what's I guess, top couple of tips from your perspective, from what you've seen? Upon, how does somebody create that holistic strategy, allowing them to leverage all the different elements they've seen today? What would be, I think, the top takeaway tips we, we do want to give out there. Hey, Darren. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, go for it. Who wants to go first? Faraz, Ryan, uh, Ross, your top tips when you you're, you can start putting out there. Go for it, Ross. I think you came up on mute. Yeah, I, can, I, I can certainly jump in. Um, you know, I, th I think my key takeaway here today and, and, and like the message is really that like how do we use, uh, how, how can like a learning professional really use what is available to kind of blend, you know, the, the blend the type of learning uh, that, that they want to provide to their employee base. And what I mean by that is like, there's obviously always going to be a requirement to have kind of in-house, very specific content knowledge or, or content created from internal knowledge, which you of course want to be produced at a really high level to keep everybody engaged and, and to have that, you know, that kind of uh, tacit knowledge within your organization. So how do you blend that with also using, you know, an, a, a platform like Udemy, whereby there is a huge volume of content that you can easily slice and dice to make relevant to your situation or to your employee base as well. So I think that the key takeaway there is just understand like what are the key uh, needs, like skills analysis, uh, skills kind of identification within your organization and from there, prioritize that and understand, okay, well, which of these of these products can help you, you know, achieve the, the the key outcomes associated with that. And I think a blend is really what's what's required. And I think that's or fuse. Exactly. Yeah, bringing it up, <laughs> bringing it all together, bringing it all together. <laughs> so I did that. Um, uh, thanks, Ross. Uh, Ryan, go for it. Um... I think I sort of echo Ross's whole blended approach. I'm a huge advocate for That's engagement, huge, as huge. you know. Sorry, uh, I'm a huge advocate for engagement. And I think fusing together a variety of different content helps with engagement massively. So I think taking into consideration the type of learner that you are and having a multitude of options really, really helps with engagement as well. For example, looking at the Udemy stuff, I know if I could learn from people in the team, for example, but if I want to dive deeper, I can go over there and, you know, find the things that I need to know and really work on myself. Whereas if I wanted to create some courses as well for the team, the new creatives joining on the team, I could utilize the easy generator stuff. And I think having that mixed approach really, really helps with engagement because 
you don't just want to be giving people one type of content. I even myself, you know what I mean? I'm not saying what I do is absolutely perfect and the right fit for everyone, but I think having a blended approach will make things a lot easier. Yes. For us, you want to come in there? Uh, yeah. So the, the piece that I want to add there is just building a, a setup that is sustainable, right? Because, uh, and, and that, of course, in reality needs that blended approach because without it, it's just going to shrink and, and uh, not be able to something that exists in the long run. But at the same time, um, next to the plan, we also need to understand who to involve and when and to what extent. And, and that's actually one of the biggest, at least in my opinion, out of all the bills and whistles of AI, the fact that it enables a cultural shift where you can have the right people at the right time and, and make sure that, you know, thanks to AI, uh, their input is, is not only valuable, but also accurate and to the standard that it should be. Um, is massive because that allows for um, achieving the, the one thing that is almost impossible, which is getting 100% of e-learning requests done, right? So getting close to that is um, requires this element. That, that's at least how, how I would look at it. Curious to hear your thoughts. Well, yeah, and I think before I maybe wrap some of those kids, I just want to ask two questions. One was from uh, Darren. So Darren, I think really open to give you a private showing. I think this is the question of the UX, the new UX reviews. Um, I think we're massively excited, Darren, about it. Um, if you want, give us a shout. We'll give you a private showing, walk you through all. Uh, we're really excited what's coming through from it's now we're calling it version four refuse for it launches in Q4, and then we've got 4.1 in Q1, and then uh, 4.2 after that. So uh yeah, I know you're a passionate UX UI person, so we'd love to get your feedback on that. Didn't want to show it too much on these open webinars because we do know that there are some unfriendly competitors that we've seen our designs literally appear on the website, you know, a week after a webinar and stuff so forth. So yeah, there's always that balance upon what you, you can and can't show towards it. Um, there was a quick question around um, VR and so forth, which is, I, I think it's a slightly different part and it's a big question and a big answer towards it. Historically, I love it. I've got every VR headset. I think the issue with it for me historically has been um, the democratization of accessibility for that. I think so, therefore, it's ended up being quite a niche part towards it, and it's great inside there. I think that will change. I think wearable devices will change. I think if, you know, if Meta continue to evolve things like the glasses and those glasses with AR becomes available, I think that that's kind of huge. And I would just say that, you know, these AI VR glasses that you might not be able to see here are just my absolute... Kind of, um, it's really weird when I'm just walking around Camden with these AI glasses talking to strange people, uh, um, listening to music. But uh, so I'm a huge believer. But another another webinar for another day inside that. Maybe just to wrap up my my talks on that that point. Um, I think the most exciting thing about AI and everything we've heard about today, right, is the ability to increase the level of personalization which increase levels of engagement. Most people stop learning, whether that's a child or, or an adult, because there's a gap or they find it too hard or it's the wrong type of modality that's for them, either in the way their brain's wired or in the moment. So I, I love the fact that what AI has given us is the ability to adapt and to, um, to adapt itself to the individual, whether that's curating the right thing, whether that's the right modality for that moment of time. Sometimes it's just an answer to a question. Sometimes watching a video. Sometimes it, it's going on a more lengthy journey to, you know, um, to, to understand foundational training in a new area. So I, I just love the fact that we've now got this amazing set of tools. I think every month feels like a year, and our ability to to learn and to harness this new technology. And then every time I'm sure that um, the Unimi guys and the generator guys will say this, every time we think we've got it, then one of the big giants releases something else last week and it completely blows our mind up, right? So, you know, six weeks ago, we thought we had it all sussed out. And then um, GPT, you know, OpenAI releases the ability to talk directly to the AI model that the all the models like Claude and GPT, you know, then release the ability to interact with visuals in a whole smart new way towards it. So it's a very exciting time um, and also a very challenging one, I think, to stay on top of it in order to continue to add value to the clients. Was there any other questions that I think are coming through there, uh, Armin? No, we're, we're good. Oh, one, one more question there from Ruth. Does using me for using AI to generate a skill set autonomy? Oh, listen, sounds like a loaded question here. Uh, um, uh, does, uh, it's based on, on job roles and could generate learning paths. Yeah, that's a so, so loaded question. I love So thanks for that question. So we're actually launching this quarter exactly that. So we have now uh, literally just been completed this month, a an automatic skills tagger. So we will take 
Udemy's content and retag that content against the preferred taxonomy. We'll do the same if feature generated content is connected with views. We'll do the same for any content we're now connected to, to retag that content against the preferred taxonomy. And that will connect initially to the job role. So the job role will, will define the skills. Uh, and then individuals can then obviously set profiles and preferences, or we can pull in from a you know a, a skills uh, platform um, in in terms of there. But yeah, that that's we we did see one of the things we really wanted to solve was that issue that we've seen out in the marketplace, which is if you do have a great library like Udemy, but you also have other ones like a Harvard and somewhere else, how do you get that ability to have that automated curation bit? So yeah, we're really really excited to launch that to the market um, this quarter. Oh, last last question. Uh, one for, for us, a question for you. Do you want to go for that one? Have you seen it in the chat? I can... uh, no, I haven't seen it. What is the question? Uh, you have something like, oh, no, we got that one already. We've done that one. Um, I think that's, I think that's it. I think we've, we've done the VR one as well. I think that's it, guys. And I think we're one minute over and we've still got half the audience. It's like, feel like that Ferris Bueller moment, Ferris Bueller moment now. It's over. <laughs> for those that see Ferris Bueller <laughs> it's over it's over that's it um thank you so much guys thank you so much to Ross uh to Ryan um to Faraj to Silver and Armand for organizing it and thank you for the audience for the great questions coming in hope you enjoyed it absolutely for that ask the question will it be available in recording yes it will um and we'll make sure that that's sent out to everyone so thanks again thanks for everyone contributing I really enjoyed it I learned a lot I learned stuff inside here and look forward to the next one see you soon guys Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.